Welcome, thinkers, to Season 3, Episode 21 of Thinking Critically. Today's topic is continuity. And a quick announcement for a change. On Friday, the 25th of March, I'm going to be doing a 12-hour charity stream for the Naomi's House and Jack's Place Children's Hospice Charity, supported by my work, Silver Lining. So, please, and it's my first stream ever, so (laughs) I would very much appreciate any and all support and donations. So, please, on Friday, the 25th of March at 12pm GMT, Tune in to twitch.tv slash thinkingcritically, or you can already donate to us if you just search Silver Lining Convergence Game On at justgiving.com. And today, I'm joined by Jared Jehoda and Matt Morris of Mid-Level Adventurers. Thank you ever so much for joining us today, guys. Uh, Jared, why don't you start? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you, Danilo. My name is Jared Jehoda, and I've been playing tabletop RPGs for about 12 years, mostly Dungeons & Dragons. Started with 3.5, did a little bit of 4E, and then up to 5E, mostly Dungeon Mastering. And during the great pandemic we all went through, I started doing this podcast, Mid-Level Adventurers, with uh, Matt here to talk about how to get into it if you're new. And we also started a Twitch stream called Newly Forged, and that's us, or that's me anyway. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for the segue there. Matt, how, how, how about yourself? Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Morris, and I'm the other half of Mid-Level Adventurers, and one small part of Newly Forged. Um, I'm the noob here. I have had uh i did a little experience with some D back in high school and then took an incredibly long time off uh, and really didn't get back into it until yeah the pandemic hit and uh we were looking for things to do with our time and i thought oh what well, i'd love to get back into this tabletop thing so thanks to some encouragement here from jared we got a couple of little like one shots going and then messed around with the idea of our podcast with sort of the uh, dynamic of Jared being the experienced uh, member of the duo and me offering some insight as a new player. And then sort of we uh, designed it to do some like helpful introductory topics for mm. people who may be new to D&D. So yeah, that's it. I mean, I've currently only got the one uh, running game right now, Newly Forged. And yeah, that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. I'm very lucky to have this mix then of of guests it should be a very interesting episode and and i I like the implication that you're the noob here implying that the you know the rest of us are extreme veterans which is (laughs) well certainly for me absolutely not the case (laughs) oh well comparatively (laughs) we're we're all players that's the important thing (laughs) indeed indeed, Yeah, yeah exactly well today's topic is continuity so what does that mean to you guys in the D framework Well, I think the first thing right off the bat is the continuity of the game timeline. Whatever game you're playing probably has some aspect of a linear time to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the players do X and that has consequences. And it would be consistent if, like, they go back to a village that they saved. People are like, hey, those are the guys who saved us from the thing last time. Let's give them a party. Let's put them up the inn for free. So having kind of continuity in that aspect i think everybody gets right off the bat you know Mm -hmm. yeah i I think it's certainly an aspect that even if you are new to tabletop games or DD um that has been introduced in a lot of rpg style video games for instance the idea of yeah consequences and you know your actions having some effect on the world and i think a lot of what jared and i have discussed in this topic in the past uh has to do with you know homebrew uh when you're talking about D &D, Mm -hmm. and that's pretty exciting i I know less about the the sort of pre-made modules but my understanding is that there is a timeline to the D &D 5e world Mm -hmm. that these uh pre-made modules and stories also follow and uh there's a long history of 
what characters are who and how they interact with the world. So, Oh, yeah, very much so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, you know, what the players do that helps to carry through a campaign or even multiple campaigns. Just consistency with the rules and environments that you use. Like, if you have Mm -hmm. a city that floats by using magical crystals, maybe any kind of floating that is not like an individual needs those. So they need those same crystals for skyships or they need it for flying carpets in some way or whatever it works out to be. That's a very good point. I feel tangent number one is probably coming now. But, <laughs> and this is what we're really good at, if you can be good at such a thing. Um, that's a good point, though, because there are obviously rules in the player's handbook that define how things work like magic and such but there are also things that are dare i say designed to be left up to interpretation at the table or by the dm so some continuity there is important as well Mm -hmm. if you're setting certain uh, interpretations of rules to or story building yeah yeah absolutely i think there's a couple of a couple of topics there you've touched on so firstly matt if you want to go and check out the history of Five you can go and look at my uh, listen to my law episode, which has all those things, and that's a shameless self plug uh, there yeah, in mid mid episode. Amazing, I love it. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about that too on mid level adventures. We have a whole history part of our. Uh, it's 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 mostly Jared, <laughs> for being honest. Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of research for these things, so we talk about that continuity in our Ravenloft uh, episode, for example, where we talk about where Ravenloft came from and, you know, how it went from being part of late eighties, second edition into third and carried on all the way up. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All stuff that I openly don't know a huge amount of, but that's why, you know, my excuse is that's why I'm doing the podcast so I can learn. That's my, uh... (laughs) exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And the, the, the other thing there that is a very, very, very good place to start is that we'll loop back around to internal consistency but what I really like to say is that one of the reasons that draws me to uh, TTRPGs is that continuity in in universe. Mm-hmm. I, I nothing irks me more now than playing an RPG and going back to a town and you speak. You know the NPCs are just in a loop that is devoid of any, <laughs> of any kind of context. You know, like I might have run yeah. through here, guns blazing, throwing grenades out. You know like a madman and then i come back and the npcs are just like have you heard of the shop down the street uh and that that like (laughs) that is something that's why i love ttrpgs because they don't have that same exclamation point over their head anymore (laughs) because you've done you've completed the quest yeah uh, and that's why i love ttrpgs because it's you always have that you know even from from the the micro to the macro there's always that level of or at least i like to put in my campaigns that level of consistency and continuity and i think one one way that that actually is helped a rare occurrence of some of the weirder elements of the rules actually helping that is as the players level up there is like an internal guideline for basically fame or for infamy so it's like you know zero to five it's your champions of your village or of your road uh five to ten is you know your your county or your you know your your city might know you and then 10 to 15 is like the country knows who you are and then 15 to 20 is the world knows who you are and that is a very useful i find guideline for ma- maintaining mm-hmm. that that consistency and that continuity in your in your universe and so you can get to a point where even the players turn up to a place they haven't been to before and people are like hey i i, I know you Rather than a classic, you know, JRPG where <laughs> where the party t- turns up to town and they're just like, I don't know who you are. I mean, you've got the you know swords and and summons and right. wacky hairstyles, but <laughs> meanwhile you just defeated this big ass dragon and nobody yeah. noticed. Yeah. Whereas I so I quite like it. Yeah, rare occurrence that the raw stuff is kind of the, the stuff that's baked in kind of can help with that that continuity and consistency. Yeah. And I think that's one of the fun things about being a a dungeon master is you get to play with that a lot, including flipping it on its head. And like, maybe they have a adversary that has gone ahead of them to be like, don't believe the hype. So it can really mess with your players, which is a lot of fun for me. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've noticed this with Jared and I I appreciate the, you, you made mention of the, the micro versus the macro, Mm -hmm. and I can already see in our campaign, for instance, 
you know, we're starting out, we have a member of the party who is desperate to spread our fame. You know, we've done very little and everywhere we go, they're like, we've done these things. We're so famous. <laughs> um, just, you know, hyping us up. Um, but already we found our like first taste of what could be a, like a reoccurring enemy with, you know, someone that escaped our capture in a small little town. And uh, we've already found them, you know, in the next town over. And, uh, you know, it's, it's things that like, as a DM, I'm sure you must have a lot of fun mm -hmm. building these encounters because there's some longevity to that as well. And like you said, Jared, these uh, enemies, uh, they have lives outside of the encounters, right? Mm -hmm. So if they go on to the next city, what that could mean consequences for the party. If you were coming for them, maybe they're waiting for you, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've had that before again, tied into this kind of infamy system of my players were, how should we put this, less than legal in there. In their, <laughs> in their, in their, <laughs> they often are, I think. Aren't they? <laughs> in, in a couple of interactions before they left a major city. So when they came back, one of their kind of allied persons was was waiting for them and was like, you can't really go into the city. It's not really safe for you anymore. So follow me and I can I can provide you an alternative route. And that's what I love because it they, they weren't I don't think they were expecting that. They were all just expecting to just rock up on the city. And I was like, nah man, you're like <laughs> you injured basically the cops and everybody hates like ah. cop killers. So like mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you you really do have targets on your back now. Uh, yeah. they start to oh, recognize yeah. you, right? Yeah, it happened in every game. My home game, they definitely, you know, were on a mission looking for a serial killer that was running through the city succeeding in finding it and instead of like reporting it they did what all players would do and took it out which mm -hmm. of course attracted the guards and then the guards are like so you admit you just killed this person well yeah but they were a serial killer according to you so they got arrested <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. but the, the, pa the parallel is a crazy because a very similar thing happened in my game uh they were a couple of sessions earlier they were at a a, a how can i put this like a low uh, quality establishment like full of you know work sailors and workers yeah. and it's rough and rowdy uh, we yeah. call it a and dive they, bar yes indeed indeed <laughs> and, uh, and they were they were like here's i'll just tip a gold well like, i don't i can't be bothered to work out the numbers here's here's a gold and obviously flashing that kind of dollar in that kind of establishment mm. drew a lot of attention and i told them at the time i was like people are looking at you like drop a bag of gems on the <laughs> on the bar <laughs> And then as they were leaving town, they got, they got jumped upon. Yeah. And painting the target themselves. Indeed. Indeed. And, and players being players, they, as you said, they just went for the throat quite literally with the, the with the druid <laughs> yeah. shape shifting into like a tiger and it was, <laughs> it was bloody and it was messy and there were onlookers. And then when the guards turned up and was like, <laughs> what the heck has happened here? <laughs> the players, they, they, they cheesed it. So I was like, yeah, you ran, you ran from the police. So uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what you expect me to, to do, but you look guilty as anything, man. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And every group does it. I have met no party that's like, we will obey all the laws in this city. We promise. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, that last major city we were in within like a day, we were breaking and entering and, Oh yeah, uh, murdering people at this warehouse. <laughs> uh, it's I'm, I'm realizing how how closely the 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 topics of continuity and consequences are. <laughs> well, they are related. <laughs> Perhaps it's a, you know <laughs> it's a, when you make an action, you are putting into effect effects which will continue down the line, and those effects have consequences. Yeah, and I think that is like such. I mean, I love video games. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, but such an incredible part of playing. D and D or another tabletop RPG is that those consequences and that continuity is shaped and sort of tailored to your party. Mm -hmm. And there are things that you might take for granted. I mean, you mentioned this in a JJ uh, JRPG. Um, you know, you walk into town looking like you know with all the best weapon and armor and crazy hairstyles, and no one seems to think twice about it. But when, like, an hour party, you're you're a turtle, a goblin, yeah. uh, a construct. And a half orc, you know, you tend to get noticed as you yes. as you travel from city to and city. And a human with one golden eye, like they stand out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're pretty. Yeah, I mean, there's no. Yeah, yeah. There's no hiding that. So we walk into a town now, and people are like, even if they don't know who we are, they're probably like, ah, these 
these cats are up to yeah, something. You make an impression, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I get, I get, the parallels continue because my, my players are Warforged, Tortle, Goliath. <laughs> I, I did have a, a bugbear until recently who unfortunately mm-hmm. passed ah. away. Um, oh, R.I.P. And then uh, there is a human and a elf. So they're the two most mundane uh, yeah. right. Hearing, yeah. hearing, <laughs> hearing, hearing me describe an elf as mundane, I think speaks for itself with regards right. to the <laughs> the rest of the gang. Yeah, exactly. I, I did stress to them at the beginning exactly what you said. I was like, people are going to cross the street when they see you coming, and they're going to want to have yeah. nothing to do with you guys. Which was quite nice because then when they went to like a, a different special city that's you know very multicultural nobody batted an eyelid and it was a nice change of pace from all these more you know human settlements where everyone was like shielding their children away <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i love that though i love to see the reactions change i mean in our group we've got the warforged uh, also and uh, as far as we know in the world that jared has created he's the only one so that has created some interesting uh, interactions with just yeah. you know fear or curiosity, mm. and, uh, and at least one like maybe at, at least at the moment minor story arc that may have occurred due to the fact that he's the only known warforged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean you got to think about it. You went into your first town with a turtle guy, this walking construct, a goblin, and goblins in this world used to be like quote-unquote civilized empire and have since kind of de-evolved after a thousand years of, you know, apocalypse and spell storms and whatever. So people are kind of leery of goblins. Yeah. And at the time, you also had your little kobold buddy. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, we were yeah. toting around a kobold uh, in the party for, uh, for a good little while, actually. Who was originally your enemy, and then you kidnapped and kind of turned him to your, like, sidekick. <laughs> morally questionable all of yeah. those episodes just in case anyone goes back to watch uh, <laughs> in hindsight yeah, yeah it's a good thing you play the cleric i know <laughs> <laughs> i'm not the best cleric admittedly but we we digress a little bit here i i think and that's probably my fault but uh <laughs> no, no not at all i mean uh... I just I, the only thing I wanted to add, and it is this this JRPG trade, but I only want to add it because it's very very relevant to me right now. I'm playing through uh, Tales of Arise, which is one of the, t- the Tales mm-hmm. of video yeah. game series, and literally there's this one point where, and it's your, your classic party of JRPG characters. You've got the you know exaggerated hairstyles, clothing. All the NPCs are like two foot shorter, just because they're just not as tall. <laughs> um, they're, they're they're traveling with you know. In, in dresses and very unpractical combat attire and they and they go to a city which is under like extreme strict government surveillance uh, oh and they're like well we'll just walk the streets it'll be fine but they, and it, <laughs> because they've just spent like i had to sit through like 20 minutes of cutscenes of how like this is dystopian you know surveillance and everyone's backstabbing each other and betraying each other to the government and that you're just like ah we'll just walk around the streets i'm sure everybody's too busy to to notice us and i'm like yeah (laughs) everyone dresses like this right (laughs) it's such a such a prime example of of that and uh yeah one of the reasons why i love having you know running that and as you said like i do take an enjoyment as a dm trying to plan that what's if they're returning to a place what's what's happened since last time and they were yeah. there you know what's what's happened to the people what's happened to the infrastructure how are they how are the people gonna respond to these crazy adventurers if they knew them if they didn't know them all that stuff is super interesting and super fun to to play as a, as a dm at the table yeah the largest yeah, the largest city they've been to now has an underground fighting ring because they decided to try to find one and couldn't and asked a local bartender and he was like that's a good idea to make money. <laughs> so now there's an underground fighting ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's not, I mean, it's not a huge city. It's funny to see that mm. already the influence the party has had. And it's one of those places at the moment we have returned to a couple of times. So we have been able to see, you know, there have been a couple of things that we're trying to solve. And we've got someone at the library you know, researching for mm-hmm. us. And so like all of these things are happening in the background, which is very exciting uh, for a player to experience. And uh, I mean, hopefully exciting for Jared to create, mm. but like, I think that this type of continuity and what sets us apart to, from a video game again, to, to use mm. that 
entire trope, but is that um, it can be morphed a little bit uh, to the party to kind of encompass, like, what is the party interested in? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I know there are people that are probably a little more excited about the combat and perhaps the politics are not as exciting, but I find, at least in our campaign, a healthy mix of sort of, Jared's really good about that, about like, yeah, how would this affect the, what would the local government say about you just going around as a vigilante group (laughs) for hire? Um, Would they hire you? Uh, Would they try to like maybe put a stop to that? Mm -hmm. Would they ignore you, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what you did. You went after this vigilante group or you, or you acted as vigilantes going after this group of criminals that you knew were criminals. You had personal experience. You knew that they had taken over a smaller town and like enslaved the population. You knew all this. You didn't have necessarily quote unquote proof, but you did no. what you felt was right. And when you invaded their home and caused a big battle, including calling a lightning storm in the middle of the day. Well, when the cops showed up, they were like, okay, we're going to arrest you now because you're the only <laughs> ones left alive here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and we were they went trial. through a trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, so, again, so one of my players returned to the city and the third time, two of them masqueraded as like lawyers representing the party. And they and they, oh they went God. to go and they went to go and fight their case. And they're like, oh, yes, well, our clients got, you know, jumped in the street and were, were assailed. And the, and the, and the right. constable's like, so they murdered them quite viciously in front of children. That's still, <laughs> that's not letting justice right. take its course. That's still murder. How do you, <laughs> yeah. how do you propose to respond to those charges? And they were just like, uh, self-defense? <laughs> <laughs> uh, brutal self-defense. Yeah, yeah. So they were like, well, yeah, we're still going to have to see them. There's still like questions we need to ask them. We can't just talk through you all the time. We need, we need to speak to them. And long story short, as I managed to kind of work, you know, game the system with some legalese for the time being, but um, they're still an open, mm. you know, wanted for questions. See, questioning. that is much nicer than what I did. I actually had them imprisoned in like holding for like a week and a half while they sent riders out to like this little town to confirm their story. <laughs> It was it was house arrest though to be fair so yeah. there was there were you know it was a little cushier than like a dungeon yeah yeah it was a very rundown shack that they made them all stay in and like they could ask for things but they wouldn't be allowed to like go out on errands or anything mm-hmm. well I have I have a, a warlock player the human warlock who is very tricksy and very conniving and very wor- <laughs> like worming his way out of things and into things sometimes so um yes when he's on when he's my adversary in real life <laughs> it makes things very tricky <laughs> oh, i know there are some players and i actually want to talk about this there are some players who are just so smart like i have people who i play with who are way smarter than me i'm and... not included in that. <laughs> yes you are and <laughs> they <laughs> And they can talk their way through things and like, well, if you look at it from my point of view and like Jared is like, yeah, no, I get where you're coming from. But then I'm like, but this guy's an officer of the law and he doesn't care. You broke his law. Yeah. That's good to keep that in perspective. And I have had, yeah, Jared has definitely said that like, no, 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 you make a good case. Doesn't matter though. Uh, You didn't convince (laughs) this guy. (laughs) Right. Like if I was there, I'd probably let you off, but (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. you convinced me too bad. I'm not, you know, the constable. (laughs) There's there's a, a a background from one of the extra books that is like it, la- the the ability of the background allows you to use legalese to confuse people if they don't if they're not from a legal background <laughs> and that like next oh, character yeah. I create I'm gonna take that because inevitably it will come in handy at some point based off the last twenty minutes of discussion. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's genius. Yeah, I love uh, that. That's got to be from like Acquisitions Incorporated. I think. Right? I think so. Yeah. 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 Oh no! Don't give Jared uh, too many ideas. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, well, that's a whole other scenario. That again, way too smart for me. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I want to give. I'm going to give throw some credit back to Jared here, and this is actually something I wanted to ask today. We'll throw it back to both mm-hmm. of you since you both DM. You know how how is it when you're trying to create this continuity for your players? For instance, I imagine that like you've got maybe a main goal you want to achieve for the party, and then inevitably they take a hard right somewhere. Mm -hmm. And do you, you know, like for the most part, do you just run with 
that and sort of reshape that path or try to like steer it back on or, you know, what, what do you prefer there? If that makes sense, I, I'm not sure if I pose that correctly. <laughs> I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing from, from my perspective, but they are, I, I have a couple of, well, the one very experienced player who's very much there to, you know, progress the story and I understand, you know, Dan Lowe's laid out this adventure for us to play, so I'll meet him in the middle. So he, he <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, being yeah. the most experienced, he's kind of taken the lead in a lot of the decision-making process. So with him doing a lot of the, come on, guys, we need to go and do this this thing that's set up, um, mm -hmm. that, that's helped a lot. And also I have instilled in them perhaps too much a sense of urgency and, and you know that that kind of impending existential doom is 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 very much a, a ticking clock. So so much so it's almost to the extreme that they don't want to do even you know on on the main on the critical path quests because they think they think they're side quests and they're like we don't we don't uh, have time oh. for this and I'm like <laughs> nah you do seriously you do you should <laughs> <laughs> so I I can honestly say I've never had anything so hard right turn that I've I've had to completely up upheave my stuff M mainly I'm introducing these kind of side parts so for, for example when they return to the city and their ally said guys you can't just walk the streets because guards will recognize you follow me I thought up of a mm -hmm. whole kind of like criminal side subplot where they go and meet some criminal king who's like I'll let you use my resources if you do this one errand for me to go and murder, you mm -hmm. know, assassinate some target right. somewhere. Right. So that that was a, a, about as side questy as it gets, and that was because of their actions. So it's more, I guess it's it's a collaborative thing. I'm I'm very lucky in that none of my players have gone. I just want to fly upside down into the sun, and and then I have to kind of <laughs> <laughs> think up. So. We're gonna go the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to think that maybe we're not. I know, I know we get derailed often, but hopefully not too far that I, that Jared has had to rethink everything. And and he and I have actually talked about this too, right? Like when you, there's only so much planning, right? Yeah, there's only so much planning you can do. But here's the deal: ultimately, I treat it like the players are their characters, and you can do whatever you want. It's gonna have consequences and other things that are going on are going to happen. Yeah. If you want to spend two weeks of downtime learning pottery, I'm going to let you do it. But if there's some warlord building up stuff somewhere else, they're probably going to get pretty far along. That's true. And that's, I think it's cool though. I mean, we may never know that as players or characters mm -hmm. that sitting uh, somewhere and taking a moment to do something uh, led to a harder quote unquote boss battle somewhere down the road. Um, but the fact that that is still going on in the background is is pretty fascinating. Well, and that's where the continuity comes into it, right? Yeah, because the world continues, right? Exactly, exactly. The world keeps going. It's not like, uh, yeah, you know, things are always happening outside of whatever city you're mm -hmm. in at the time, um, obviously. And you can also rely on your players to do that. And you probably had the same thing, Daniel. You mentioned that you have a player who's more experienced and kind of takes the lead. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's consistency in and of itself. Like you can trust that continuity of it. Mm -hmm. And everybody like s starts with an accent or comes up with one or loses one or whatever. <laughs> but that's not what, like when I think of continuity, that's not what I think about it. I think about it as their play style, their habits. Is their character argumentative? Is their character flimsy uh -huh. uh, in terms of like wishy-washiness, which isn't really a word, but we're going to go with it. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's an excellent segue. However, I think Danilo was you were going to say something a second ago. Uh, only, only that a, a lot of my uh, mental effort regarding continuity is spent with those mi is micro things. So it's, it's more like there's never any big branching. I'm going to go and start up a florist. It's always more like <laughs> I'm going to talk in a certain way to this NPC who then I have to go, oh, okay, I'm going to have to think quite hard about how they're going to re respond to that. It's more, yeah, it's more <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, uh, uh, the intimate things rather than big world expanding things. But um, mm -hmm. I, a couple of my players have got, you know, actually most of them have got things bubbling on in the background. It's just... Yeah, they're all, they're all, between six of them, between analysis paralysis, between 
this overarching <laughs> existential threat not many of them have been too proactive in being like guys can we go a detour i want to go and see my parents uh so there's not <laughs> there's not been too much they there. have parents <laughs> that's insane they're not that's all they're not all orphans of. yeah the same backstory oh my god you let parents happen in your world that's crazy <laughs> i got i've got the whole i've got the whole gamut i've got the whole like <laughs> yep my two parents live here and they're fine to also i woke up with amnesia and don't know who i am i've got the i got ah. the extremes in my game <laughs> that's amazing we have our our warforged has amnesia so that's pretty yeah, funny yeah, well, yeah. So, so does mine that's no oh i don't God. i don't i don't believe you guys you're, you're, this is some you're, this is like uh this is crazy prank spoiler they're <laughs> the same character in two different universes <laughs> is your warforged also a barbarian no he is okay. a, he is a, he is a druid although oh, i wish i'd just say yes that's just cool. to say that's yeah cool. oh, that is cool does he turn into like mecha animals yeah so he's, he's got very strong you know aesthetic vision so he's like i want to be a organic transformer essentially so oh, he's, cool. yeah that. so he's, he's made like bark and vines and originally once he might have been you know more inorganic material but over the passage of time because he was you know deactivated for two thousand years or something it's he slowly adopted the druidic way oh i love Very that that's fascinating actually that's yeah cool. that's all another topic too is like uh backstories but um, <laughs> no, you you touched on this a, a bit ago, Jared. The um, speaking on continuity. I mean, so far we've sort of talked about storyline or mm -hmm. world building and world progression. But I think there is something to be said about the continuity of a player's yeah. choices. Absolutely. Right? Um, hopefully, a player has a strong idea of how that character might play in the beginning, but obviously things like that will sort of change. I think that I know for us in the first several episodes, we were probably all finding our ourselves and sort of the dynamic within the party, which is a big thing too. But yeah, I think it can be easy sometimes to uh, accidentally maybe lose sight of something that your character, well, their alignment, uh, if we're going to mm. use that word. <laughs> um, I've done that before too. Uh, and, and looked back on things and they're like, oh, is that really what Spook would have done in that situation? That is a very good question. And funnily enough, one of my, my notes here I'm looking at is player character continuity as in keeping, mm -hmm. how, how do you keep your own character consistent given the often outlandish situations they, <laughs> they find themselves in in a given campaign like yeah I don't, yeah any any tips or advice on that or, or how do you do it matt i have a kind of funny one here so i i am a player in one campaign that uh a player of mine in my home game put together so his other dms could play instead of just having to run them all the time which was cool very nice so he took uh water deep dragon heist and turned mm -hmm. it into a full campaign as opposed to just a little module like we're level 13 now it's crazy the stuff we've done and it's a one through five adventure module but mm. so my character i have a gnome fighter i'm a battle master and i'm like the lawful one i started kind of like chaotic good and then kind of he ended up being like lawful good for a while and now he's kind of lawful neutral while the rest of my party is chaos incarnate <laughs> Now, how do, and that's like, well, how do you just not go along with all their shenanigans? My DM has given me Azure Edge, which is a legendary item that is a sentient weapon, but mm -hmm. it only works for lawful individuals who want to protect the city of Waterdeep. So, like, I am constantly being like, I don't want to lose my axe. I don't want to lose my axe. <laughs> I got to be consistent in how I'm playing this guy. That's a very important motivation, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's a bit of like, you know, carrot and stick with that. But if you're not going to use like the rewards section or the like, you know, here's the linchpin of your character being effective in combat mm -hmm. kind of ideal. I don't think that if a player experiments with their character or wants to try going in a different way, that's being untrue to the character. Because these characters are supposed to be like real people, right? And so people change and grow. I mean, I certainly had people who I did not like in high school, who I've met 20 years after the fact, and it's now like, oh, you're not a dick anymore. Okay, well mm -hmm. done. You know? So 
I think it's okay to let a character expand as long as they are faithful to where they've been, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, It it, it can be difficult. And and growth is definitely important. I think if your character never grows, then maybe you're not having... Maybe it's not as fulfilling for you, you know? That can Mm -hmm. be a variety of things. Uh, You could start with, like, for instance, we've got a, um, a goblin in the party and part of their character is that they're quite selfish. (laughs) <laughs> and they've been trying to slowly learn how to let go of some of that. Yeah. But there's always going to be part of them that's like, you know, inherently selfish. Um, I've learned, uh, you know, my character is has become the co- sort of conscious of the party, which sometimes, you know, uh, annoys the other party <laughs> members who are a little more... Uh, <laughs> oh, what's the word? I'm trying to be polite. We'll just say spontaneous. Um <laughs> And part so of a that, very, very political answer. There. <laughs> <laughs> I love them all dearly, uh, and I play a cleric. So I, I mean, like you know, Spoot wouldn't be terribly abrasive in describing them. Um, part of that is you know trying to set what those rules are for yourself at the beginning, and I think sometimes it's just good to remind yourself. I think you know I have definitely had moments where I've gone, ooh, I've like looked back and reflected on like, okay, am I really making choices that? And I don't think you have to be perfect. Obviously, we're all human people playing far more imperfect characters and versions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But also, I think finding what are those things you truly want to, like, stick to as a character or stand up for or whatever. I mean, I remember a particular moment where my character had was given a choice uh, basically to, like, back down and live or stand and fight and probably be outnumbered and died. But in the moment, you know, other people's safety was on the line. So, uh, and, and I actually kind of learned in that episode in that session that that was a pretty big deal to my character. I decided, no, even if it meant that I could die that day, I was going to stand up for, you know, the thing I thought was right. And I even told, you know, party members like, Hey, if you need to leave, do what you think is best, but this is the decision I made. Mm-hmm. And and then so I think moving forward for me it's like sticking to those moments and finding those strengths of my character that I'm like now this is a part of my identity I'm going to try to shape my future this you know decisions based off of these traits yeah and I think as a DM the important thing is to provide those moments for the players mm-hmm. right because you want to give them those moral quandaries so one you want to see how it plays out but two you want them to get a sense of who they're playing. Yeah, like yeah. In that instance that Matt is referencing, they made it to the big boss and he was expecting them. He knew they were there. He knew they'd been coming after him for a while. Continuity and play right there. Yeah. <laughs> and he had a bunch of people around and he was like, look, I've been waiting for you all. You can join up with me and we can all get along or you can die. And like there were party members who were like, maybe we, maybe we should join up. There was one in particular who was really thinking about it because he knew that this big bad had his 1,000 year lost husband locked away somewhere. So that's a big reason to like mm. consider it because you want to save your husband, but you also have your friends here. And so mm-hmm. they tried to like finagle with it, like, can some of us leave? And he was like, any one of you can leave, but the first order those who stay will get will be to kill you. That's pretty tough. I'm not going to lie. There's some like uh, <laughs> some big moments, some really like heavy moments that can come. Yeah, it was uh, a dark you know, moment. From that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think that's what makes it, the playing it interesting and memorable, right? It's yeah. like Jared said, discovering those things about yourself. And perhaps this is another tangent in a way. But I, I mean, I do think it lends itself to, as the DM is sort of helping to, to, to shape the world around you based on your decisions, you're also learning what what anchors your characters and how that affects your play. I say, I say, you say tangent. I say it's a perfect marriage with what we were talking about earlier on in, the, <laughs> in that 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 delicate dance between the DM world building and keeping things consistent, but also tying in uh, you know backstory elements to provide these moments of you know what what would my character do in this situation in a way that. A makes sense and B can show how much they've grown. And mm-hmm. um I think that's that's a lot of the difficulty of longer form, medium to longer form campaigns that DMs don't get a whole lot of advice on, but certainly not from the books, is are those little like how can I provide a, a very 
fulfilling and but logical and consistent encounter or decision or something you know something to do in a way that is you know still makes sense in the world and is fun to play and and is balanced correctly in terms of difficulty and all that kind of stuff that that is i think where the difficulty lies and if i was to put a point on it that's probably where i get a lot of enjoyment myself when i can see the wood for the trees of like oh how much cr should this monster be Uh, (laughs) which takes up way more like mental arithmetic than i than i'd anticipated but yeah these are the ideas that keep us up at night and come (laughs) to us in the shower (laughs) <laughs> well like as as you guys are just talking i was thinking man i really gotta do i really gotta work, pull my finger out because i've got a couple of guys in my campaign that are probably overdue some of these elements and i was gonna say like i think as you said matt like it takes a few sessions some more than others to embed that personality embed those here's you know here's the continuity of my character here's what they would do you know in any given inputs here's what the output would be you know like yeah <laughs> you change that variable yeah. i would respond yeah. in this manner to get that in first and i think the motivation is a good way to do that so be it a you've got to look after this weapon be it a you've got a partner and kids to feed at home i think that's a, a great place to start i've just been thinking like so for my the warforged druid who i mentioned who has amnesia new player blank slate in terms of character and player uh, and their in their approach to the game so I have gone, like, when we hit to their backstory arc, I had pretty much free reign to describe yeah, their backstory yeah. and also what's any implications that may or may not happen when they, when they get there. There's, there's needless to say, there's going to be some revelations and then some huge decisions off the back of it that's really going to be like, right, you've had 80 sessions to decide who you are and who this character is. Put your money where your mouth is and, and make it make a <laughs> yeah. few decisions. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, a good point. I love it. And that's both a great curse and a great, responsibility and a blessing given to a uh, a dm or a gm mm-hmm. because that's either a character or a player that really trusts you to like run with it and not screw them over or it's someone who doesn't know any better <laughs> <laughs> true and i i would like to say though in defense of dms um it's hard enough uh, figuring out a single character and, and what your motivations are and and uh how you're going to act i i can't imagine trying to to shape all of this around all of these different characters, some with different, um, yeah, uh, with better morals than others, you know, for lack of a better term. Mm. Yeah. It's hard to give everybody a chance to shine, but I think it's really important to like, let the game play out as it's going to, while giving everybody a chance to have fun and actualize their character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, self, self actualization. We're getting onto some psychological <laughs> like Maslow's <laughs> hierarchy of needs right now. Like, <laughs> You know, it's funny you mentioned that. There's a whole <laughs> developmental psychology thing about continuity versus discontinuity. Oh, okay. Well, 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 well we got to do another. We got to do another episode on discontinuity then, because that's way too much. <laughs> at, at, at like 45 minutes in, that's way too much. To... <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, for real. <laughs> I know. I was wondering how we were doing in time. I, I, I felt that uh, I was like, oh, I haven't even hit some of these points. We've gone so far, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. So. To bring us back into CSL, I just wanted to say on that. So, so as I said, that that particular player has a very strong theme, or at least now he does. When he started, it was just I want him to look like this, but now he has actually built quite a character around him in terms of like abstaining from violence, you ah, know, yeah. and and yeah. like he he's really lent into the druidic side of things of like we shouldn't kill the creatures and the beasts if we if we can because that's just mindless, you know, unnecessary death. Which, yeah. I, which I love. So the stuff I have prepared, not to be too spoilery, but is the questions, his history and where he was built and, and came from. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned, it was it was maybe inorganic and the, and the ramifications of like, am I who I think I am nowadays? Or got, you know, <laughs> are, you, are you who you are when you're born? That kind of, that those yeah. kind of questions. And, and if I've got the power to change some things should i you know should i take that power or should i not and uh yeah so that that should be very good and i'm and i must say i'm quite proud of i think you know as you said jared yeah, that it's it's a blessing and a curse and mm-hmm. i rested on my laurels of having like a very low maintenance player and being like right i don't have to worry about that player because there's no backstory i have to worry about and i can just <laughs> so you know i spent like 20 sessions doing nothing so now it's about time there should be some <laughs> some, yeah. some pay after that yeah, we're about we're about sixty one sessions in. Tomorrow night's actually our sixty first session, 
And we mm-hmm. have only just barely gotten a glimpse of uh, of Defect's backstory. Mm-hmm. So that's the M- the, M- the yes. Warforged with amnesia, sir. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to get these two players to like me up there should be like a like a social group for amnesiac oh, yeah. warforged yeah. players and like... it's funny how similar they are beyond like oh they're both warforged they both have amnesia the way you and i as dms have kind of played with that like who you are are you who you're born with or who you become or who you choose to be those yeah. are definitely themes that it sounds like you've incorporated and i've definitely put them into what i'm doing with my warforged barbarian that i'm running for him Mm-hmm. Which I'm very excited to see play out because he's already questioned himself so many times. I mean, he's a barbarian that has taken up poetry and has a fondness for ducks. You know, like he's <laughs> he's exploring the sort of like very non-barbaric sides of, of mm-hmm. himself already. Mm-hmm. But that, you know, maybe there's a little like crossover. Speaking of continuity, maybe there's a, a multiverse timeline where they, they uh, meet each other somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have, a, have a one-off <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we've we, we've talked a lot so far about that you know just now we were talking about the, the player character continuity and let's you know, flip, flip it on its head for a bit and we're going to return to the dm side of things and i know we've we've talked at length about kind of keeping a consistent world and you know the the wheels of industry keep turning if the players have a holiday for two you know player characters have a holiday for two weeks stuff stuff's happened in that time I wanted to go at it from a more DM's point of view and things like continuity errors. So the classic one in in recent memory is, you know, isn't there that um, there's like the Starbucks coffee cup in the Game of Thrones episode or something, which technically isn't really a (laughs) continuity error, but it it is the one that just makes my mind uh, think down that train of thought. So my question, I guess, is more to, to Jared here around like, how do you deal with remembering npc names voices and, and mannerisms and and keeping track of other plot points to avoid those kind of continuity errors to avoid those times when the players go back to a city and go hang on wasn't that like an elf last time we spoke to that person and then you're just <laughs> like uh shit uh let you know yeah. you remembered wrong like <laughs> how do you deal with it and try and try and mitigate those things that's when you use the keen mind feet <laughs> right that's when i turn it on i'm actually a 14th level wizard that is in the wrong dimension um, <laughs> <laughs> whoops wrong timeline huh <laughs> no uh actually it's a good question and believe it or not it's a pretty simple answer any town or anything big that they go to i have a list of like the important npcs they're going to meet and i include what is their heritage what do they look like and then like a note or two about what they may sound like i am not a voice actor by any mm-hmm. means. I'm not Matt Mercer. I'm not Brennan Lee Mulligan. I'm not, I'm not any of them. So I have to take notes like sounds like Donald duck or, <laughs> <laughs> or sounds like that guy from New Jersey or whatever the note is. Usually they're oddly Scottish. I think that's been the only <laughs> like finding the accent. No, I'm just teasing. I mean, yeah, uh, we just met a, awakened raccoon who had a jersey accent oh, amazing <laughs> a new jersey accent uh in the last session and i took down those notes like this raccoon has a jersey accent and one of the players was like is this guy from jersey and i'm like and so i'm like nope that's his name now <laughs> and <it> just, <laughs> so he's jersey the talking raccoon amazing so like any kind of spontaneous npcs i take notes on like real quick like uh this guy described him that way but the plan, the planned ones, I can do a little bit more in depth and kind of ready myself for. But ultimately, the Im- improvised ones are the ones the players always go back to. I was gonna say that. Yep, it's important that you do take notes because I'm sure on almost every occasion possible, we return frequently to some just like in the moment character he made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have gotten really good at having a hand I'm not watching write down notes and a chicken scratch I have learned to decipher. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, but it definitely can be hard and time consuming, especially if it's a lot of rapid fire, quick little NPCs or mm. little vignettes. And sometimes with newly forged in particular, because we stream it, I record all the episodes are recorded. They're up on YouTube. If I forget uh-huh. something, I can go back and look at it, but I don't have that luxury in my home game. <laughs> so 
I learned to take notes about various NPCs or, or places that look a certain way or whatever fairly early on when I started DMing. Because when I first started DMing, I was so bad. Like, I cannot tell you how horrible I was. I killed, like, all six players in the first game that I ever DM'd. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you would think, though, speaking of taking notes, you would think that us as party members could also just go back and watch, you know, and be like, oh, that's what that where we put that item. No, we're pretty bad about that. And it mm-hmm. takes Jared sometimes to be like, if you look in your inventory, you would see that you've got a note about this particular <laughs> Okay, That makes me feel better because I've also had to do that. And it might make you feel better that my players are just as just the same. A f- funny example <laughs> recently is um, when we were playing in person many years ago, I printed out a bunch of items and, you know, cut them to size. They had little, little almost like a you know, study card of a, a potion and whatnot oh yeah yeah they never got hoarding mentality they never got around to using it uh you know (laughs) we 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 migrated to remote online everybody's just using their dnd beyond and ever adding everything to that until i I got a a photo sent through from one of my players and it's he said oh this fell out of my notebook today can i still use it and i was like man if you haven't if you haven't drunk it in game of course you can still use it (laughs) (laughs) that's literally just been like rotting away in his notebook this little tiny sheet of paper that probably hasn't been opened for years and he's like oh i've got this really useful potion that would have come in handy a couple of times i'm like well yep but i guess you can still use it now (laughs) you have to roll dice against the potency after so many years yeah (laughs) I, I do the same thing in my in my in person games. I print out little cards and I give them to players when they find things. I have a little tiny like I don't know it was, it was some box that something was shipped in. I kind of retrofitted it to make it look like a little treasure chest. Mm-hmm. So if they defeat the bad guy and get the treasure hoard, I put little slips of paper of like any magic items or special potions in there, and there's usually like chocolate coins or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you know, a fun little interactive bit that you can do in a home game where you're in person that you can't do online, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, back in my day, we played D&D together (laughs) face to face. (laughs) I, 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 I do miss it. I do miss it. If only for that. You know, one, one reason being to have these little props and, and things and bits and bobs yeah. around in there. Mm-hmm. I, I, again, one final funny anecdote on this, which I know is completely off topic, but um, I, I remember I wanted to, the puzzle, players to do a puzzle and I wanted them to do it in the real world. And I remember rushing around my like local supermarket and ended up buying like a Rubik's Cube for like eight, <laughs> 18 pounds because they're hideously oh, wow. expensive. <laughs> Never end up using it. <laughs> I don't know how to play with it, so it just sits on my bookshelf like <laughs> completely yeah, not used. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I have a couple of wooden puzzles and Rubik's Cubes that I have acquired over the years for just in case I need to throw them at a puzzle where I'm like, uh, here's the puzzle. <laughs> uh, solve for green. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. Someday I will get like one of those big uh, sand timers, hourglasses, and mm-hmm. then I will really scare them because I'm like, clock's ticking. Oh, I know. He's already pretty good about that, though, verbally. Uh, <laughs> hey, y'all can sit around and discuss the uh, finer points of who's going to take first watch, but uh, the night is uh, still going. Yeah, it's just drawing in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need to take more notes is basically my thing. It's hard. Um, I, like, I, I, so many times they've gone and spoken to an NPC and I've gone, oh, man, did I... Have they spoken to this one before? Did they have a voice? Is it just going to be my generic NPC voice? Probably. Do they notice? Nine times out of ten, no. Uh, good. <laughs> <It's a small laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Mostly not. I, I will say from a player's perspective, though, those moments are fun. I mean, those are like the human moments of like, oh, whoops, this guy sounded like this last time. Yes. Oh, well. And there are times when you can do a voice one day, but like you can't do it again the next day. And like, that's just. You know. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you're at a table or, you know, virtually at a table with friends or, or mm-hmm. you know, at least people that friendly ribbing will occur, of course. But mm-hmm. um, to take any pressure off of potential DMs out there, um, despite what you may hear, we're not all sitting around expecting Matt Mercer's to DM our games. <laughs> like, it's okay. You know, we're just going to have fun regardless. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything I, I know, Matt? You said you had a bunch of stuff that we haven't we haven't covered yet. So, is there any any uh, any of that stuff you'd like to chat about? Oh gosh, no. It would take. Uh, it was just you know I had a couple of fun questions here about multiversing and things that are not really related. Just if I if I run out of things to talk about, they're on that list of like. Um, no, I think we did well. I, I would just like I'll give one more little plug here to to DMs in general 
And um, to Jared in particular, it's been a pleasure playing with him. I've noticed that he really loves the world building. And, um, you know, he's told me stories about sort of like connecting things with characters that might occur in the same world across different campaigns and, Mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So I think really the sky is the limit if you are someone that enjoys that sort of creativity. I mean, you know, go nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you can't say you've got weird, fun questions and then not ask those questions that's not uh, that's well not no I, I i noticed we were out of time so i was like i better do my final plug and just uh sh- zip it well no no come on come on one give me your best give me hit me with your best shot do it do it do it do it do it do it, do it. oh i don't i don't even know if it's that weird now but i was curious like is the have you ever considered um you know like the possibility of maybe multiple timelines or the idea of a multiverse you know what does that look like do you get a chance to like sh- have your characters play a one-off campaign with similar but different characters you know Mm -hmm. and have the ability to change things entirely because it's sort of like this timeline versus you know yeah mm -hmm. so my my guys are very you know i'm fully committed now into having this one big existing campaign they with the with the warforged backstory because he was you know deactivated for x thousand years there is going to be an element of uh time travel if i dare say uh so mm. less branching timelines more when they go back to the future god knows what's, ah, god knows what's going to wait see. for them um mm-hmm. so that that's more there however one of my previous guests he did say he operates in kind of like a shared so instead of instead of you know a single dm making the world he and a bunch of dms have made co- like continents on 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 yeah. said world and ob- obviously often the stories don't often overlap but you know grand events and you know cataclysmic events can be seen and felt you know they they, they'll get together and say oh yeah the you know the mountain of MacGuffin exploded and there's now ash in the sky and stuff and then the next the next time the dms go back they'll say oh you you see all this ash cloud over the you know far over the sea over over the next island and stuff so that's that's how one way they do it and it's quite a nice kind of soft multi-universe i would say because they're not like they can't like literally tomorrow just teleport over and ruin that other person's game. But there are there are little, <laughs> there are little nods and little touches and little stuff that are that are that, yeah. that, that suggests that you're part of a bigger a bigger thing. Those are fun. I haven't I haven't seen anything quite that ambitious yet, but I do know a DM who is uh, doing a Pathfinder game that had two separate games going for a while in neighboring cities with the intention of bringing those two parties together for a joint. Uh, you know, campaign of sorts, mm-hmm. which seemed like a nightmare logistically for um, tying everything up. But you know, the ambition was nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, Matt, you know, our ranger, Adis, is full of time travel shenanigans. I know. I, I'm, I, and, and also, uh, you know, he has a thing for portals. So I, I'm sure there are some, <laughs> some time traveling things in our future, much to the chagrin of uh, my cleric. <laughs> yeah. He was very happy in his current realm. Yeah, he is playing a, uh, a far wanderer. I think is the subclass. Oh, yeah. So he's got a penchant for the Feywild and portals in general. Mm-hmm. He has a sword that can open a portal to the ethereal plane. So he's got some some stuff, and uh, he was frozen in time for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. And if you think that's not going to come up again, it will. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but. One thing I've always kind of wanted to do is to have the players meet doppelgangers of themselves. Like in in any game, this isn't specific to a particular campaign, but to meet doppelgangers who come from like the dark timeline. Oh. And they're like, not necessarily like evil mirrors, but like close enough to them that it's almost scary. Have you, have you seen Community, the show? Are you, Mm -hmm, yes. The darkest timeline with the, the dark characters from there. Yes. Is is what Uh, I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah, very similar kind of thing. Yeah, I just think like that would be fun because it would really like screw with people. I think we have already joked about that in our campaign, haven't we? That like if my character dies, then he's coming back as a death cleric turtle or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here's I I did almost exactly that. It wasn't it wasn't like the the alternative universe equivalents, but what I did was have a party, maybe or maybe not, on the same wider mission as my players and. I'd shuffled up all the racing class combos. So all the all the races were <laughs> nice. present and all the classes were present, but I'd basically like ciphered, I'd shifted them one down one and and, and <laughs> yeah. I, I went well, I, this is this is so stupid. I went one step further and 
butchered and crowbarred uh, anagram names. So I took all the actual character Ooh. names and made anagrams out of them. Some <laughs> some which were very not names because of how <laughs> how anagrams sure. work. Just a string of consonants. consonants. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, uh, that that has never ceased to pique their interest. They're always like, yeah, but what? Were th- why were they kind of like us but not like us? And where were they going? And what were they doing? Except except one combination which I kept the same because I wanted to. So the human warlock was the human warlock. All the rest were shuffled up, so that was that was my point to be like he is the you know that that player character is the focal point of this side Ooh, thing. Oh, I like yeah. it. That's like interesting. It. I had a, I had intended it to be um, literally ships passing in the night, and they were going downstream, and the other characters were going upstream, and uh-huh. I just wanted them to do. I don't know if you've ever seen the British film Shaun of the Dead where they uh yes the, yes the two groups pass down that alleyway and there's like a equivalent yeah. i wanted it to be like that except my players like no stop the ship we're going after that <laughs> ship and i was like oh god i'm gonna have we're to we're boarding yeah and oh, I, I i managed to kind of placate them enough but it was it was a oh, man it was a shit show actually because we had like two people in the water swimming we had two people flying one had gone to the docks one oh. had stayed on the ship and i was like oh god oh, this gosh. was just meant to be 30 seconds and it's now like <laughs> four hours of trying to get the six of you back onto this bloody ship yeah. to go back to port but uh, every easter egg becomes a buffet i tell you <laughs> oh gosh yes i can imagine yeah as someone who yeah only as a player i uh i am likely to follow that red herring yeah. <laughs> Oh, you, you know, do. We, you do. I we can do, tell I you. Know. you do. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do. And then I think it's like, really, this must be really important. Um, <laughs> yeah, now, we haven't I... done anything quite that wild. We did have a very short-lived sort of what-if uh, campaign series where we – this was a very cool concept. I think Jared developed this, actually, um, maybe you and another player, where there was a collection of players, uh, and mm-hmm. then they would we would do a series of, like, one-shots – and we would sort of rotate who played who. So like one week, maybe I play the fighter. Mm-hmm. The next week, perhaps I play the sorcerer, et cetera. And, you know, w- win or lose, um, we sort of reset, you know, after so, so many sessions. Because um, there were a couple of like TPKs that we were like, all right, well, that was an alternate timeline that no longer exists. <laughs> yeah, it was fun just as an experiment to allow yeah. players to maybe try a class they hadn't tried before or a different characterization of something they liked that someone else had done and then explore upon that Mm -hmm. it was it was a fun little exercise uh i do kind of miss it but it kind of like died (laughs) hard to keep going like so many things do the the candle that burns twice as bright as they say (laughs) yes Uh, yes. exactly (laughs) what what, uh what about you jared any any final final thoughts there is one that i did want to touch upon and that's the continuity in actually playing the game like the act of playing the game Mm mm-hmm the same people meeting up with friends. A lot of people, myself included, look to these tabletop RPG meetups and plays as uh, a way to relax or de-stress or to help or deal with their mental health in some way. And if you miss that, it can be disruptive and you can really feel like something's wrong. Like, we had to miss like two weeks of the game that I'm a player in and all of us felt like we were really off kilter without it. So that continuity of playing these games in whatever schedule it is, whether it's weekly or monthly or twice a year, however it works out for you and your group, I think it matters to us as players, to us as dungeon masters or game masters. Mm -hmm. And I think having those connections that we make at the table and carrying them forward really helps us in a lot of ways. And sometimes, you know, people have to step back or things don't work out or the group is not working out for you and you can kind of move on and find a new group or whatever happens. But when you find that group that works well for you, I think it just helps you as a person to be happier with yourself and with your with your gameplay, sure, but just with your own mental well-being by experimenting in a safe world Mm. if any of that makes sense no it does and it's a pretty unique experience i think um i mean there are other outlets for playing in a communal setting be it online or yeah you know sports or whatever but i think this is a pretty unique experience for a lot of people to Mm. have that again yeah continuity that sort of consistency with a group of trusted Mm like-minded individuals to just have some fun yeah and they've done research on this 
when you play a role playing game like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or Monster of the Week, whatever, you remember those experiences the same way you remember experiences that you actually did. Oh, amazing. Which, which is different than if you play a video game. You remember playing the video game and, oh, this happened in the game and it was cool. Mm-hmm. But when you recount a story of a tabletop role-playing game, you say, oh, we did this. I fought a dragon. I jumped out of the hot air balloon and came stabbing down with my sword and the warlock blasted and it accidentally hit me or whatever the story is. Your brain stores... Uh, tabletop role play game memory the same way it stores actual memories that you've experienced, which is a unique thing that I don't think happens in any other form of, you know, classic entertainment, whether it's TV or going to see a theater show or listen to a band. It's a whole different way the memory is stored. Mm-hmm. No, well, absolutely. Thank you for that. I could, I couldn't have picked a, a better a better topic to finish on so uh <laughs> thank you very much um is there anything you guys would maybe i don't know uh like to promote well first of all thank you for having us this was a lot of fun yes absolutely and definitely please check out mid-level adventurers uh, it's our podcast where we talk about things to help new players or players coming back uh how to get into 5e again and uh we have our first season is kind of wrapped up by habit, but we've been talking about coming back with a new second season and a bunch of stuff coming down the pipeline for that. And you can also catch us on uh, on Wednesdays on Twitch at Newly Forged and watch us there. That's N-U-U-L-I. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I'm really bad at plugging, so I just let Jared do all of that for us. What, what, what he said. <laughs> yes, what he said. Thank oh, you, Jared. God. Uh, I'm so bad at it too. I'm telling you, the social media stuff I am so bad at, but I end up doing it. It's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our he's our marketing manager as well. We're relying entirely on Danilo, so check out the links below because he's done all that hard work. That was your your first and only mistake you've made today. Uh, <laughs> is relying on me. <laughs> ha! The joke's on you. I've made many mistakes. <laughs> well uh all that's left for me to say is thank you ever so much guys for coming on that was that was a uh, yeah very very interesting and very very discussion i, I loved it yeah well, thank, thank you so you. much it's been a this great was a joy yeah yeah a lot of fun thank you for your time not at all lovely to have you on after after uh, quite some time it almost feels like it's been it's taken too long to get you guys on so i'm, I'm very happy to uh, i know i'm to... sorry for that that's all on me no 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 <laughs> no, no no it's all good i'm just happy it happened and i think we had a lot of fun here uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely yeah so uh, as as jared said all the links will be in the episode description please do check out uh mid-level adventurers and newly forged and otherwise thank you all for listening and good night and now it's time for the patreon shout outs thank you to robert hartley dm for viva the dirt league and writer on the DD logic web series I would encourage everybody to check him out at Robert Hartley GM on Twitter and Twitch. Thank you to Optional Rule, a two-time guest of the show and a very insightful and knowledgeable source of information. Please check them out at www.optionalrule.com. Huge, huge, huge thank you to a great friend of the show, Matthew Perkins, who's out there making hilarious and educational Dungeons & Dragons content please go and check out his stuff at matthewperkins.net where you can find links to all of his socials and all of his content, including his own Patreon, which I would very much encourage you to check out. Thank you to Matt Street at mpstreet88 on Twitter for supporting the show. If you need support running your personal or business schedule, head to virtualtimehustle.com or on Instagram to make that difference between should do and done. Boss it better with support from Kat, who will help you get back that essential time you've been searching for. If you would like to support what we do and get four shout outs a month, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingcritically, or you can just buy me a coffee at ko slash thinkingcritically, 